Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, August 30th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, don't believe the hype. The establishment says that any future damaging revelations about Hillary Clinton will be a lie perpetrated by disinfo agents from Russia. Meanwhile, the FBI says they are ready to release a new report on Hillary's emails as soon as tomorrow. Then, comedian Dave Chappelle says Black Lives Matter is the worst slogan he's ever heard. Plus, another social justice warrior gets triggered, this time by a dashboard hula girl. All that plus much more, up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. a passenger in your car, like that doll is offensive to me, but you don't want to take it down because you like found it at Goodwill and it's, it's fine. While President Obama says there's no such thing as election rigging, even though a record number of dead people voted for him, but the FBI director says the threat of election hacking is very serious. Now, this was the FBI. They've responded to recent concerns about the U.S. voting systems being targeted for cyber attacks. And uh, FBI director James Comey says we take very seriously any effort by any actor he says, to influence the conduct of affairs in our country, whether that's an election or something else. So his comments came just one day after news surfaced about FBI warnings to states that hackers had infiltrated one state board of election and targeted another. So we're already seeing evidence of this surfacing. Of course, President Obama said, I mean, even in the wake of the election, uh, the DNC party rigging it for Hillary Clinton, stealing it from Bernie Sanders, even after all of that, Obama totally gaslights the situation and says there's no such thing could never happen here but wait there's a perfect opportunity to blame the russians you know it's not just now a vast right-wing conspiracy now vladimir putin is actually in control of that vast right-wing conspiracy so they are propping him up as the boogeyman and this was a senate minority leader harry reed sent a letter to Comey and he expressed concern over the threat of the Russian government tampering in our presidential election. It's more extensive than widely known and may include the intent to falsify official election results. And of course, they're already setting us up to think that the Russians have gone in and changed the metadata from any emails, anything that can come out of the DNC or any further damaging information that comes out about Hillary Clinton. It's Russian agents. Ooh. So they're preparing to blame the October surprise on Vladimir Putin. So this is um, the Washington Post actually reporting this latest conspiracy theory. But don't forget, it's just the conspiracy theorists that are pushing out these crazy conspiracy theories. Uh, really, it's Hillary Clinton and her entire establishment machine that's trying to get her elected. But they say any damaging revelations about Hillary Clinton that come in the form of this October surprise, including information about her ill health, will be the work of Russian disinfo agents working on behalf of Vladimir Putin. This is the post Dana Milbank asking, are Vladimir Putin's operatives planning to dump edited DNC documents on the eve of the presidential election? And then went on to suggest, suggest that this contrived October surprise could show that Hillary really did lose most of her brain function in that fall several years ago. Perhaps they'll show that the Clinton Foundation has been funding the Islamic State, or they'll have Hillary Clinton admitting that she didn't care about those Americans who died in Benghazi after all. <laughs> but this is exactly what we're going to find out in those emails, because that's truly what already exists there. I mean, I would bet money on it. So that's why the DNC is already pushing that it's Russian agents who have gone in and they've actually changed the emails and then they put them back out there as if it's the um, original document. And they're, they're actually saying that this is what happened in the Soros case. So right here, going on in this Washington Post article, they say you know, this, is a, this is the sort of the technique that the Russian hackers used in the Soros case, stealing documents, altering them, then releasing them as the original, right? Because we don't have any bad actors like Hillary Clinton or George Soros, who are heavily invested in directing the way this country is, is moving. So they don't want anyone to, to believe that we truly have to be concerned about what is going on and who 
our Secretary of State is meeting with behind closed doors. Now, this is even after the State Department has come out and said, you know what, we've found 30 more deleted Clinton emails on Benghazi. Okay, so this is Hillary Clinton saying, oh, you know, I, I deleted everything that wasn't work related, things I didn't really think anyone had to you know, worry about. Well, she obviously didn't think Benghazi emails were that important because she deleted them. So this is a State Department attorney saying Tuesday, the agency had discovered 30 Benghazi related emails among the records that were recovered from Hillary Clinton's private server. A judge asked the agency to hasten its review of the documents in preparation for release to Judicial Watch because let's not forget, it's only because Judicial Watch made that FOIA request that we found out about any of these supposedly uh, emails that Hillary allegedly, she turned them all over, but then it turns out there were plenty more they didn't find, which for whatever reason, the FBI didn't find them during their initial investigation. Um, so the discovery of these emails is very significant because com Clinton has repeatedly assured the public, Congress, and FBI agents that she turned over all her work-related communications in 2014. Now, in a separate case, Judi Judicial Watch has actually sent Hillary Clinton 25 written questions about her decision to set up this private email. Um, her responses, she has to submit them within 30 days and they will be considered sworn testimony by the court. So that is still ongoing. That's going to be coming out here in just a few weeks before the election. So that'll be pretty interesting. And tomorrow, the FBI plans to release a report on Hillary Clinton on, on their email investigation. This is the, the, the report that the FBI sent to the Justice Department in July, recommending no charges in the Hillary Clinton email server investigation. So we'll be able to have even more details on, uh, you know, just what it was the FBI uh, found and why they came up to this decision of recommending no charges, even though uh, James Comey basically made the case that she, if it was any anyone else, we'd be going to jail. We'd be in prison right now. But because it's Hillary Clinton, you know, we recommend no charges. She should still go get to be the leader of the free world. And a lot of people are also... Uh, Hillary Clinton's camp actually put it out that, oh, she was never under FBI investigation. They were never talking to her. She was the target of the investigation. It was her server. So, of course, she was under investigation by the FBI. I cannot believe how much the media, the establishment media, is protecting this woman to make sure that she gets put in power. Now, here's something that she's been really uh, proudly Hillary Clinton has proudly been coming out saying how she even has members of the GOP, really top ranking leaders backing her rather than Donald Trump. Well, here's one that might surprise you. Uh, this is Paul Wolfowitz. He was George W. Bush's Iraq war architect, and he is c coming out saying that he is likely going to vote for Clinton. So Wolfowitz was a top official in the George W. Bush administration, like I said, referred to as the architect of the Iraq war. Um, he's part of a growing list of GOP national security and foreign policy officials who have announced their intention to support the Democratic presidential nominee. So as you can see, there's no difference between the left or the right. All the war warmongers want to vote for Hillary. She is their, their gal who is going to help them with their plans for globalization. And now they go on to point out that Hillary Clinton's probably not going to be as proud uh, of this member of the GOP supporting her because, of course, she wants to bleach bit the fact that she voted for the invasion of Iraq. That those are that's something that's been dogging her since she made that vote. Now, um, Wolfowitz told the Times in July he's probably going to vote for Clinton, but get this: he noted he had serious reservations about Clinton, but Trump was unacceptable unacceptable because of what Wolfowitz viewed as dangerous positions on Russia and China. So here's the man who literally crafted a bungled war for us to invade Iraq under faulty pretenses, destabilizing the Middle East, just like Hillary Clinton's hard choice to take out Gaddafi and destabilize Libya, further destabilizing that region. We have this huge refugee crisis now that we're all, uh, all having to suffer under, but it's Trump who is dangerous because he doesn't want to start World War III with Vladimir Putin. So totally crazy here. And they're all kind of crawling out from under their rocks to show you who they really are and who their candidate is, who they would support.
Now, getting back to these supposedly hacked and altered uh, leaked memos of George Soros, now Breitbart is reporting that one of these leaked memos reveals the Soros plan uh, for federally controlled police. So this was one of the leaked documents from George Soros' Open Society Foundations exposing the billionaire's level of involvement in attempting to build what his organization describes as a national movement to reform local police forces across the U.S. The U.S. contingent of Open Society held a planning meeting titled Police Reform, How to Take Advantage of the Crisis of the Moment and Drive Long-Term Institutional Change in Police Community Practice. So this extensive memo documents that Soros finance groups and personalities are what influenced President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, which was released last May. And so it just goes on and on. I mean, it, this Breitbart article really gets in depth of just how the, the Open Society Foundation has its hands in everything, how they are funding hundreds of thousands of dollars to movements like Black Lives Matter. The Open Society has also called for a discussion on whether it would be appropriate for the Soros group to try to shape the Black Lives Matter movement in the future. You know, this is after they've already given them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this is the same Open Society who is working on shaping the Internet and the regulation of the Internet, specifically what gets to stay on the Internet and what gets to be removed. And of course, the Open Society Foundation will decide who is the bad actor or not with preferential treatment given to Open Society members. Originally, President Obama promised that the Fed's handover of the Antitrust Protected Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, would not involve the United Nations. If we fall for... You know, a, a bunch of okie doke Was this yet again a naive move by an incompetent president of the United States, or has this been the plan all along? Time and time again, Congress has failed to pass draconian laws to control the Internet. The Communications Decency Act of 1996, the Intellectual Property Enforcement Act of 2007, the Cybersecurity Act, the Protect IP Act of 2011, and SOPA, to name a few, all failed miserably against the ironclad integrity of the First Amendment. The globalists scurrying to their den of iniquity at Bilderberg would hear none of it. Their very fortunes and lives depend on it. The public knows too much already. Control of the Internet had to be torn from the protection of the U.S. Constitution. Larry Strickland of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, a Commerce Department agency which has overseen ICANN since 1998, said, We will not accept a proposal that replaces the NTIA role with a government-led or an intergovernmental solution. Now, after the full weight of Edward Snowden's revelations opened a treasure trove, the United States, in pure Hegelian dialectic fashion, offered to cede control to a multi-stakeholder, i.e. lobbyist-dominated model. That's right, the Internet will be in the hands of lobbyists, the very bottom feeders of the whims of globalism. How bad is it? In the intervening years, the United Nations and the European Union had jostled for control of the Internet. During a meeting in Dubai, the International Telecommunications Communications Union, the telecom branch of the United Nations, demanded rules governing the Internet to be rewritten. Specifically, the international organization proposed deep packet inspection authority that would allow it to monitor and censor content on the Internet. The United States walked out of that conference in protest. What appears to be the mundane task of assigning parking spaces for Internet businesses will more than likely face in the very near future a level of censorship that will make the free-thinking people of the World Wide Web's head spin. The Inquisition 2.0. The European Union has proposed the creation of a censorship and mass surveillance framework for EU countries funded by the European Commission. The Clean IT Project webpage explains the plan called for police to patrol Facebook and other social networks in search of extremist material and propaganda in addition to allowing users to flag terrorist content and turn others into the police. 
In addition to censorship, the ICANN transfer will allow for a globalist taxation scheme. Former Bush administration State Department senior advisor Christian Witten told the Daily Caller, if the UN gains control of what amounts to the directory and traffic signals of the Internet, it can impose whatever taxes it likes. It likely would start with a tax on registering domains and expand from there. Transition that stewardship to the global community. Fadi Chahadi has been the CEO at ICANN since 2012. After having negotiated the full-scale globalization of the Internet, Chahadi will be aptly rewarded by the New World Order, acting as a senior advisor at Abri Partners, a private equity firm that controls an already monopolized media. Also as a co-chair of the newly formed World Internet Conference in Wuzhen, China. And last but not least, a senior advisor to Klaus Schwab, founder and chairman of the World Economic Forum. Schwab attended Bilderberg in 2016. An internal proposed strategy from George Soros's Open Society Justice Initiative calls for international regulation of private actors' decisions on, quote, what information is taken off the Internet and what may remain. End quote. Those regulations, the document notes, should favor, quote, those most supportive of open society, end quote. Open society being George Soros's organization. Soros and company, rather than striking directly at free speech progenitors like Infowars.com, are one month away from recklessly pulling the rug out from under everything. Now that ICANN has relinquished control of the medium, globalist institutions can move forward with plans to scrub the Internet of all content unacceptable to the global elite and their minions at the United Nations. John Bound for Infowars.com. It is... Uh... I don't even really know where to start on answering this question. Uh, of course the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? Ladies and gentlemen, we can never let Barack Obama live those words down. Either Barack Obama is completely pretending to have no idea what a rigged election is, or he is completely ignorant to the fact that rigged elections are a very real thing, especially in this country. So, since Barack Obama says he doesn't know what a rigged election is, we'll go ahead and explain it to him. Now, the latest example comes out of the FBI, who has just announced that state election databases have been hacked by foreign operators. So, this has prompted the FBI to warn election officials across the nation of the possibility of cyber intrusion in the upcoming general election. Of course, this is on the heels of the DHS and Jay Johnson expanding government cybersecurity measures at the fear of hacking. The Democrats wish they had been ready for hacking as the DNC was hacked and emails exposed how they rigged the primary for Hillary Clinton with collusion in the inner party, collusion with the media, and of course, the superdelegates. But DHS is now prepared for cyber intrusion and they are warning of cyber intrusion in the up coming election. So how is it that the FBI and the DHS are both well aware of the possibility of rigged elections, but the President of the United States says he has no idea what that means? Now, this goes beyond just rigged elections, folks. Voting machines can also be hacked. Fox News did an expose on how the Diebold systems can be hacked years ago. So here's what happened. Yeah. Inside the machine, it was keeping an electronic record of every vote. Right. Um, three votes for George. But the computer virus went and switched the votes inside the computer's uh -huh. memory. Right. And when you see this result, what you see, look at the tape right here. Hold it right there very yeah. carefully. One vote for George Washington and two for Benedict. So you're saying oh, that goodness. hackers would have had had to have done this before people voted. They would have had to have infected it with a virus wow. and then it skews the before results. Most recently, CBS has now had hackers on air and filed a report demonstrating how voting machines can be rigged. So again, how is it Obama seems to be the only one who is clueless of this? So just to recap for you, Barack, your Democratic Party rigged the primary for Hillary Clinton. That was exposed with hacked emails. 
Hundreds of cases of voter fraud has been well documented in the last few decades, including much of that relating to ACORN, who Barack Obama has been directly affiliated with. Now, DHS, again, is expanding its protection of fair elections and warning that cyber intrusion is a real issue. Voting machines, including the Diebold machines, have shown that they are hackable, and that is also a real issue. And now the most recent, the FBI has stated that state election bases were hacked. So that is what a rigged election means, Barack Obama. I don't know if you want to crawl out of that rock you've been hiding under, or perhaps you want to quit being a total fraud and pretending like you don't know what a rigged election is, when you know your party is very responsible for rigging elections. In fact, it happened to get you into office, Barack. So if you really don't know what it is at this point, I just feel bad for you. But of course, we know who wants to rig the election, folks, and we know why. They have to rig this election for Hillary Clinton because she is being destroyed right now by Donald Trump. Just look at rally turnout where Donald Trump gets tens of thousands of people any city he goes to, and Hillary Clinton is lucky if she can even fill a gymnasium. So not only do they have to rig it to get Hillary in, they know that Donald Trump is not a controlled candidate. G Donald Trump is not a globalist. So in order to keep a globalist in the White House, they will have to rig this election for Hillary Clinton. Now, it's also interesting to notice how we're already seeing the narrative being pushed that Russia is going to be the hackers. It's Russia that might be hacking databases. It's Russia who might want to hack the election. So this is a greasing of the skids to start demonizing and playing Russia off as the bad guy. And then who knows, if Trump wins, they'll probably blame Russia for hacking the system. So these are all the things we're seeing going on with rigged elections. But it's amazing to me that Barack Obama says he has no idea what a rigged election is. Well, Barack, in case you didn't, we just documented it for you. But you know what? We're better than that. We know damn well you know what a rigged election is. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com. Well, if you're into big foreign wars, arming our enemies to fight against us, arming our enemies to fight against each other, then Hillary Clinton is your candidate for president. Warmongers are coming out in mass. I'm joined in studio by the lovely Leanne McAdoo to talk about this. Leanne, these neocons, neocons like Paul Wolfowitz, he was featured in the LA Times. He was the chief architect of the Iraq war under Bush, and he said, hey, look, I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. He was the top official in the George W. Bush administration. He was referred to as the architect of this war. He showed Bush how to depose and take down Saddam Hussein, and he stabilized their country. And oh, guess what? He's a Hillary supporter. I was shocked a bit when I read this. Uh, he's just one of many neocons that are saying, you know what, we love foreign wars, we love destabilizing, and oh yeah, by the way, I'm with her. I'm with her, yeah. exactly. And this is, of course, Wolfowitz is probably one of those uh, GOP leaders that she's not going to brag about coming mm -hmm. over to her side because this, uh, her decision, her vote to take us into war with Iraq is something that's been dogging her throughout this entire election cycle. She wants to just bury that. She doesn't want people to understand that it was her hard choices that are leading now to these mass graves that we're seeing in Iraq and other countries, the total destabilization of the Middle East, and of course, this massive refugee crisis. And now she and our community leader, President Obama, are painting themselves as the saviors for these refugees when they're the ones that made them homeless in the first place. Right. Well, Obama first took credit for ending the war in Iraq. All he really did was pull out and further, you know, add to their dissension into hell, if you will. You mentioned those mass graves, 15,072 graves in total. They were actually stacking the bodies up. They killed so many people. This is reminiscent of Clinton's administration. I'm referring to Bill Clinton. When we heard his secretary of state, then Madeleine Albright, say, you know what? 500,000 Iraqi children have been killed because of our policies, but we think it's worth it. That was right. her exact phrase. We think that, you know, the price that we're paying with all the blood on our hands, you know what, it's a small price to pay for what we're getting in return. Right. And it's not shocking at all that these warmongers, specifically the Republicans, hey, guess what, there's no difference between the Dems and the R's in cases like this. And uh, he's just one of many national security and foreign policy officials that are in her pocket. Right. I mean, it's so surprising. And of course, now the FBI has just announced that they've found 30 more emails, uh, Benghazi emails. They're going to talk about those uh, 
Wednesday, they say. But of course, this is right before WikiLeaks was about to release what they say is the most damaging emails yet, that they have 1,700 emails proving that Hillary Clinton knew about U.S. military weapons shipments to al-Qaeda and ISIS. You remember uh, Rand Paul really pressed her on this issue, and she played it off to Turkey. Well, I've never... No one has raised that issue with me, and she's the Secretary of State. Not only did she know about those weapons being shipped, she's helping to facilitate it. And, hey, make a donation to my foundation, and I'll get you in here a lickety split to sell you some weapons. Isn't that? Isn't she just a sweetheart? So he, you mentioned Rand Paul, and I love that because it brings up a discussion that he had uh, recently where he said in Syria, look, we've armed two groups that are actually using U.S. weapons, and they're fighting each other. That's what's happening. That We don't even know whom we're arming that uh, uh, Syrian militias, they've been armed by different parts of the U.S. war machine, and that they're fighting each other in Aleppo, that it's we've descended into hell so down that we don't even know, uh, you know, basically who we've equipped and what they're doing with it. And this is all under Hillary Clinton, right. by the way. They're all under her watch. These are decisions that she makes as Secretary of State. She hands them over to Obama. He puts a check on them, and they go out. You mentioned Benghazi. What difference does it make? I can promise everybody watching this, you think Benghazi was bad? You just wait on Honestly, I mean, we, we're looking at her record. Right. What Imagine what, what she, what they can't recover because she wiped it with mm -hmm. leech bit, you know, <laughs> which was uh, because everyone uses something like that when they just want to get rid of their yoga routine. And right. Their, you, know. you know, I mean, honestly, you made that great point. So she yesterday or a couple of days ago, she came out and she said, what, with a washcloth? You know, yeah, with a cloth. Right. Yeah. So they, they do not know who they're arming, nor do they know who they're bringing into this country. But destabilization is the name of the game with your Hillary Clinton candidacy. Well, if you are a warmonger or a neocon, she is your candidate. Big news coming out of the EU today. The European Union has demanded that Apple pay back about $15 billion in taxes to Ireland over what they say was an illegal sweetheart deal with the Irish government. Now, the Irish government, of course, would like to just write that off. They want to pawn it on their civilization to go ahead and make up for these taxes that they're lacking from these huge corporations. Apple is already threatening to cut jobs in Europe. Um, so, you know, here we have them playing ransom basically with their jobs. You know, how dare you come after us for these taxes? So joining me now is David Knight. And David, I just, I wanted to bring this story up because here we have a corporation, they say uh, Google and Amazon could be next, but here we have companies that are already skirting their responsibility to pay U.S. taxes here by funneling, funneling them through um, Irish headquarters and yeah. these countries offshore. But then when they actually do have jobs here in this country, they're giving them to uh, refugees and immigrants. And nothing underscores that more, Leanne, than this article that was on Breitbart today talking about Bill Clinton's comments saying that we're going to rebuild Detroit, but we're gonna do it with Syrian refugees, not with Americans that are there. Right. Not of course, Detroit <laughs> used to be the center of our economy, Motown, Moto City. Now, I guess it's going to become Mohammed Town if he has his way. And he pointed out in the video that's embedded in this article, Detroit has 10,000 empty, structurally sound houses, 10,000 of those. Hey, we could bring Syrian refugees in. We could rebuild the city with it. And they point out in Breitbart, this is exactly what Donald Trump had just said. He said Hillary Clinton would rather provide a job to a refugee from overseas than to give that job to an unemployed African-American youth in cities like Detroit who have become refugees in their own country. Right. And quite frankly, if she has her way, they just brought in 10,000 refugees from Syria alone. Syria, where we have created a war, where we have created a massive collateral damage, hatred for the United States. We're going to bring the people in that we cannot vet. We're gonna bring them in in massive numbers. They just brought in 10,000. Hillary is announced she's going to do six and a half times that. And so right. the article points out that if they're able to do this, in Hillary Clinton's terms, she could bring in more people than are currently living in Detroit from the Middle East. And as Trump has said, for the amount of money she's doing, we could rebuild every inner city here in America. But I wanna focus on the guy who is on the right side of that picture. As you're looking at that Clinton Global Initiative, let's talk about this Clinton crony capitalist billionaire that's on his right. That guy's name is Hamdi Yulukaya. Now he is the guy who owns Shabani yogurt. And what we have here is really a tale of yogurt and tuberculosis, a tale of rape and refugees, a tale of massive migration that is being pushed on us by globalist billionaires, and also control of the media in that small town, control of the government in that local small town. We're gonna see all these different issues in here. 
But also, I think the crowning achievement that we see here that has been uh, achieved by this Hamdi Yulukayat, this guy sits on the board of the Federal Reserve. And he's, he's not, not even an American a US. citizen. He's a Turk, okay? He has not wow. given up his Turkish citizenship, but he is sitting on the board of the Federal Reserve, creating monetary policy here for the United States, and yet this guy is not even an American citizen. But he is highly connected globally. Listen to some of the titles that he's got. He's an eminent advocate to the United Nations Refugee Agency. He's a member of the Presidential Ambassadors for Global Entrepreneurship. He's received a UN Foundation Global Leadership Award, and most importantly, okay, besides his Federal Reserve membership, he has a special title with the president. He is his ambassador, President Obama's ambassador for global entrepreneurship, which means that he gets to meet privately with Obama without the press there. Now, who is this guy? As we said, he's a Kurd. He's a Turkish citizen. According to Bloomberg, he has a fortune of $5.4 billion. That was back in 2013 and deep ties to the Clintons. How did he start? This is very key because this is a tale of how you get rich in America anymore. The rags to riches has to include a payoff to people in government. You have to buy them as well. This guy got his start back in 2005. He took out a small business loan from the government. With that, he bought a craft yogurt plant in New York. He launched it in 2007. In five years, Chobani was the number one selling Greek yogurt. Then he got serious. He bought a couple of New York senators. He bought Chuck Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand. And then he hired a big lobbying firm, Cornerstone Government, okay? The lobbying firm, he spent $700,000 lobbying with them since 2012. What did he get for that? Well, it ties in to Michelle Obama's school lunch program. He was able to, on a fast track position, this is something for the tofu people to get included in the school lunch program across the country. They spent nearly a decade lobbying and begging the uh, USDA. He did it in only eight months. And what they did was they got them to say that they're going to replace meat with his yogurt on the on the menu, okay? Right. And uh, so what he did with that, then he went to Twin Falls, Idaho, a small town with only 44,000 people, built the largest yogurt factory in the world, spending $450 million. Now, and uh, that was in 2012, as he was lobbying for the school lunch program. He's per pretty certain that was going to go through. Then in 2016, he announced a $100 million expansion of the factory because what he got initially, back in 2012 when he started this, he got a four-state pilot program that was given to him by the senators who had connections with the USDA. Now he signed up in all 50 states to push that through. Now what is he doing in terms of pushing refugee immigration. He recently went to Davos and he told his fellow billionaires that they need to hack the refugee crisis. They need to hack it. How are they gonna hack it? They're going to bring in massive workers that they're going to hire instead of American workers. And this is what we said about open right. borders from the very beginning. And what I know the he globals, brags about that. Yes, what the, the globalists do is they export uh, jobs, they export the uh, factories rather, and then they import the workers. And that's what's going on here. And he's got already his founding members. He's going to have 100 multinational corporations. His founding members are UPS, MasterCard, LinkedIn, Western Union, IKEA, and others. What has it done to the small town of Twin Falls? Now, this is a small town with only about 44,000 people. He is bragging that 30% of his workforce is migrant refugees. He also brags that they speak 11 different languages. And he has to hire translators to work there 24-7, around the clock. Now, Idaho is one of the top five states to get refugees per capita. Many of them are sent to this Twin Falls area to work in the food business. And this was the location in June of this year mm -hmm. of the story that we covered about the rape of a five-year-old girl by three other juveniles. Now, they videotaped that rape. And it's an interesting story of media control as well. Because not only did we have the national media like Slate uh, calling out Infowars and saying, this is what they said uh, back in June. They said, the Drudge Report trumpeted the Infowars story with the headline, Syrian refugees rape little girl at knife point in Idaho. And this long article from Slate, they said, well, this is nothing but a bunch of rumors. It was put down by the government as well as by the local press there. They all said there's nothing to this. And yet you got people like the Drudge Report and Infowars pushing this. Now, Breitbart talked to the father. He told them that he watched 30 minutes of that recording of what they did to his daughter, the rape, the attempted rape, the urinating on her by these kids before he couldn't take it any longer and broke down. It is not a fabricated story. 
And just in this month, in August, we had a 33-year-old mentally impaired woman raped by a guy named Muhammad there in that area, in that small town in Twin Falls. So it's a case of this massive billionaire coming into this town where there's only 44,000 people. Do you think that the local city government is going to stand up to him when he's going to bring in $550 million just in expenses there, not to mention right. the number of people that he employs? And then the press itself, they have a monopoly on the local press. This is the way they shut right. it down. Warren Buffett, with uh, Berkshire Hathaway gave $11 million to the local press and they have control of that media. This is an encapsulation of the way the crony capitalists, the multinationals work, they come in. And as I pointed out at the very beginning, I still cannot get over the fact that we've got a Turkish citizen because he's so connected to the Democrat party, people like Chuck Schumer, people like the Clintons, that he can set on the Federal Reserve Board that he can bring in these people without any control, without any consent of the people who live there by buying up the local press, buying up the local government. It's right. an absolute and, amazing ass story. And I know that we even reported on how some of the elected officials there said that there could press charges against anyone who would dare speak to the media or talk about, put stories out there, even on Facebook, yes. about these refugees who raped this five-year-old girl. They want to protect so much. Uh, the refugees that are coming in to work at this plant and one of the at the expense of the, their citizens there. Uh, I have to put this in real quickly. They have a 500% increase in tuberculosis. That is another one of the costs, right. as well as $54 million from the local and state community. That's the cost of the taxpayers. For this Unbelievable. Billion. Well, yeah. you got to watch where, like they say, vote with your dollars. I think I'm not going to be buying that yogurt anymore. <laughs> I'm not. Just a heads up, if you are a social justice warrior, you might be triggered by this segment. This is not a safe space. We do not have any coloring books here to help you deal with your feelings. Uh, obviously joined by Margaret Howell and Ashley Beckford, we are going to break down the insanity that is engulfing the left, the universities. People are just, in the name of social justice, they're bullying everyone. Mm. That's right. That's that's exactly right. They even are saying at this point that Pokemon Go uh, <laughs> needs trigger warnings. Uh, the U.S. Constitution needs trigger warnings. This is an article uh, from it's called uh, Barnard College. Uh, there's this woman woman who's at a private women's college, and she's just going ahead and talking about how she goes on social media and everywhere she goes. Everything's this perceived oppression, oppression, racism, sexism, classism, able-bodiedism, heterosexism, and all the other isms. And basically, everywhere she looks, it's saying trigger warning or content warning or simply TW or CW. They've got acronyms now. They're saying Pokemon goes racist, classist. It's ableist, I guess, because you can't run out and play it. They're saying the Constitution <laughs> could prompt thoughts of oppression, persecution. Genocide, it's crazy. Even white men, Donald Trump, the police. If you mention any of these on social media, watch out because these things are triggers. I just pointed out today on Twitter the fact that Chris Brown is a, a woman beater and, you know, he's so oppressed. Well, I mean, there's okay. actually like a live standoff with him all day. And well, I triggered so many people. They've attacked yeah. me. How dare I how, stand up for this low life? Dare you? We need right. a more inclusive and a just society, and that includes oppressing. Every white male that we find exactly on the right. planet, regardless of what they have or haven't done, as long as we perceive that they've done something offensive, you have the right to shame them, to humiliate them, to belittle <laughs> right. them. To a perfect example, there's a video that's going viral over a social justice warrior flipping out. She's get, getting a ride in a lift, and she flips out because that her driver has a hula doll on his dashboard. Those are evil now. <laughs> They're evil. They're racist. Yes. Can we go ahead and play some of the video and we'll talk over it just to give you our commentary on this girl. <laughs> you thought that was adorable. You didn't think about like the pillaging of the like continent of continent Hawaii. Of it's Hawaii. definitely a continent. <laughs> and that's it. They're so smart. Oh, you didn't? Okay, so you won't get rid of the Is she wasted? Do we know? Because that was like really cute. You, you know, I really well. hope that she has been drinking and is too. highly inebriated because her voice and the way she talks. This is the society of women that have been watching the Kardashians for years. Exactly. <laughs> like you, it's like a white Ever male. since the OJ trial. <laughs> like, 
But now you're judging me, you're assuming we're on. <laughs> and so this goes on and on. Here she goes, but it just, okay, guys. So it just, she just continues to bully her Lyft driver. How dare you? I am so offended. That's Awful. really racist, and I'm oppressed. <laughs> you know? And he's I can't like, you didn't kick her out. Right, Forget exactly. Forget the $9. Go. Yeah. This is so not worth $9. Drop her off, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is like, he's he's like, I'm being kind to you. I'm being nice. And you're berating me. You're accusing me. He's, he was biracial, first of all, because he's Asian. And he's like, <laughs> how is this racist? Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain to me nicely rather than just demanding I remove an object that I bought at Goodwill? And it's <laughs> funny because... She has, um, people have been, you know, bashing her because this video, right. she's like, I'm recording you and this is going to go viral and it's going to go on Oh, it did go viral. Yeah. Right. Oh, For the not wrong in the reason. way that she wanted. She's so she's so emblematic of what's happening in this country. We have universities that are, are social justice theming housing options. They're basically tents on the ground. If you want to live like a warrior, you're gonna have to pitch a tent in the yard. And they're trying to promote this inclusive and just society. So basically, we're all gonna have to live in tents so that we can all be equal, uh, because we're all offended by the same you. things. We're exactly, this new brand of uh, students that are going to be in open discussions about what's best for the community, what kind of activities to make people more socially aware, which, you know, I would think that going to college alone, that would kind of make you That's yeah. the whole point aware. of college, except exactly. for nowadays. And you would think that too, which is the whole reason why you bring speakers to the campus that are a little bit controversial to provoke thought and provoke debate, discussion, civil discourse. As long as right. they're not they mean, if they're Ann Coulter or anybody else that they perceive as mean, there's a ban going on on campuses to, to ban mean speech. We're going to call it hate speech exactly. because if you offend me, you're a hater, you racist bigot, you have no place in cultural discussion or discourse. And it's amazing. So basically, being an SJW just means that everything offends you. Right. Well, they should. And well, and, and Brown <laughs> University, okay, yeah. because of this and uh -huh. because of these controversial speakers coming on, uh, they actually last year had to turn an entire room on campus into a safe space. Oh, really? They got cookies, coloring books, soft music, pillows, mm -hmm. and video Not of coloring. frolicking puppies along with trauma <laughs> counselors. Now, this was in response uh, to a speaker that was invited to the campus, and they said it was just too upsetting. Right. Adult mm. thumb sucking session in progress. Yes. We need to not well, that I, I'm I'm curious anything. to know. I, I hate to run back to that <laughs> other article real quick, but is, is it at least glamping? It's is not. It glamorous? It is it's hard not? for okay. All right, individuals just checking, with just any checking. gender identity as long as all parties <laughs> agree to the living arrangement. So if wow. you have a gender question, if you're gender oh, okay. fluid, we want you to live in this tent with us because, you know, we, we don't discriminate. If you if you identify as male one day and female the next, you're perfect as long as everything offends you. You know, if, if you're a bedwetter, though, we're going to put you in a special tent. Oh, because, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, do a special tent right. for them. Well, I'm really curious to know if anyone, if any of these social justice warriors actually saw this, because I know they love MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, and I was shocked to find out that MSNBC actually played a fried chicken ad instead of a Hillary racism clip. So this was something that happened uh, earlier uh, on the weekend. And uh, basically, they were talking to someone from the NAACP. And they found, uh, they said, let's listen to part of her speech, uh, Hillary Clinton's speech, where she talks about uh, Trump and is kind of bashing him. But inexplicably, KFC actually aired, uh, an, uh, I mean, uh, MSNBC actually aired a KFC ad instead wow. of what they were supposed to actually add. <laughs> so I was like, is there somebody in the control room trying to give black people a message? You know, what, what are they trying to <laughs> say here, you know? Seriously, I mean, that, that, that is me. befuddled. It's almost <laughs> like when they went to the Trump uh, the Trump rally, and they wanted to go talk to the. Mm -hmm. They they said, well, that was you know just one African American that was there who was mm -hmm. totally for Trump and who's like, stop trying to racially divide us. And they were like, well, that was a complete mistake. Whoever did that back in the control room? We right. find Mark Burns, Pastor Burns, who came to Austin apologizing yeah. to Hillary for this, you know, image that he put up depicting he didn't need her. To, yeah. He shouldn't. Have, I mean, he's a he's a he's the pastor for right. Trump and. He shouldn't have painted. He put her in blackface. He was making a joke. This is coming from a black pastor, but he was even forced to apologize. She's been in blackface before, we know. On her own accord. Right, exactly. And the, oh my gosh, we were looking at pictures of this earlier. It's not her it's first like, time. Are you, okay. okay. <laughs> I don't understand her. why. What I don't understand is where is this victimhood coming from? Like, why is that almost like a badge of honor to be so oppressed and such a victim? Yeah, like Colin Kaepernick or whatever his name is this week. 
and how he said, you know, Black Lives Matter, so I'm going to sit down, I'm going to disrespect the entire country. We need to go back to the good old days when everyone loved Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle recently said that Black Hello, Lives Dave. Matter is the worst slogan he's ever heard. And I'm really glad to hear him come out and say that. He didn't directly say that he's going to go ahead and support Trump. But at least he's out there saying, hey, we need to give up this racial division. You know, this is not a great slogan. This isn't helping anyone. So, well, we why have, did he have so that was what he said? It was terrible because it's like so divisive. Uh, yeah, it's so divisive. Um, it's not uh, helping anything. It's not uh, doing anything for um, you know, black people. It's not he helping. He didn't want to record it on a cell phone, though. Well, right? notice that. Well, he no, doesn't. He doesn't have me. any recordings actually at his shows. Now. Well, just like with uh, Dwayne Wade's cousin mm -hmm. who was shot in Chicago. Now all of a sudden, it's okay to talk about the fact that black people are being killed in record numbers mm -hmm. in Chicago. But they didn't say anything about the 11 other people who were murdered, 67 others shot and injured that exact same weekend exactly. in Chicago. It only is because it's a celebrity now that we can talk about it's this. hundreds per month. The yeah. only time that Black Lives Matter is when it's a celebrity that you, you know right. or you think someone be, who can. If they could they could actually pick perceived, somebody else. Higher perceived value. You think that they would be so angry at Hillary Clinton, who her husband is responsible for the mandatory sentencing guidelines that have imprisoned more black men in this country than any other political figure, uh, you know, in American yeah. history, that would be a point of anger. Like, if you're really looking at the facts here, I would direct that at her because, honestly, she's responsible because of those guidelines that were established in the 90s for that imprisoning, mm -hmm. you know, th hundreds of thousands of people for right. crimes right. that her husband committed. Exactly. Well, I mean, obviously, this is, we haven't seen the end of the social justice warrior movement. Sadly not. <laughs> but this is the end of the news for tonight. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.